Welcome to the Genuinely You podcast channel, which is packed with advice and tips on how to live your life with purpose. Do you wish you felt happy and fulfilled? Are you feeling stuck, wishing things could be better? Are you ready to take some action and create the life you want? To start living an empowered life, you need to recognize and make full use of the power and freedom that comes from being genuinely you. Your host is Gina Gardner, a number one best-selling author whose whole life has been about supporting people to achieve personal empowerment, helping people just like you recognize that they can. Hello there, it's Gina Gardner here and I'm really pleased to be on Passionate World Radio again. I and my friend Rachel are going to try something different today. Rather than present around a theme, we're going to have a conversation around it and part of that is going to be bringing up the common questions that I get asked time and time again uh, by different clients. Of course, we've anonymised them. Um, Being confidential is a very important part of coaching. What I'd really like from you, if it's possible, is some feedback, whether you prefer the presentation style of show or whether you'd rather have conversation um, with both of us. And also, if there's a theme or a question that you have, let us know through the radio uh, um, website or through my website, which is https uh, colon forward slash forward slash genuinely hyphen you dot com. And if you just put genuinely hyphen you dot com, um, it should come through. Anyway, our first attempt at this, I've no doubt, will get better. And our first theme is going to be that of self-esteem. I think that there is a world epidemic of people who feel badly about themselves, who don't feel that they're enough, who have beliefs such as, I'm not good enough, I'm not old enough, I'm too old, um, I'm not rich enough, I'm not pretty enough. And so we're going to be exploring that theme. So bear with us if we're a little hesitant at times because this is our first time doing it like this um, and we're going to be somewhat out of our comfort zone. Now, your comfort zone is an interesting thing. If you stay within your comfort zone, to start with it feels like a nice cosy duvet in the winter, but very quickly it becomes stultifying. And if you're not careful and you stay only within your comfort zone, um, your world becomes more limited. So as uncomfortable as it is, as you step outside your comfort zone, very quickly, your comfort zone expands. And that's what we're counting on this morning. So I'd like to introduce Rachel to you. Um, Rachel's an author, written um, a really fantastic uh, spiritual book called uh, The Point of View. And I would really recommend that you you read it. But let's get on with the topic, which is self-esteem. So Rachel... What do you think is one of the most common things that people have talked to you about and, and, and asked me mm. around self-esteem? Hi Gina and hi listeners out there. Um, yeah, well, um, I suppose as we're coming towards uh, the end of the first month of the year and um, on telly there's loads of diet programs, a proliferation of them, I guess one of the first things that I think about when, when questions about self-esteem is body image and how many people... Uh, hate their body I mean and can be quite vociferous in their description of their their bodies like that Um, and as a mother to a teenage uh, daughter it's it's an issue that does obviously worry me a lot that um, the the magazines and and the fantastic images that that get shown to them how on earth can she ever or anybody ever live up to those so yeah body image I think is is the first topic I think it's really interesting that if you look at very small children Mm-hmm. I've never come across a baby who is pointing to their bottom and saying, does my bum look big in this nappy? There's a point, isn't there, yeah. where instead of recognising that we are perfect as we are and engaging with the world without any of those limiting beliefs, there is a point where suddenly we have that sense that we don't measure up. Mm-hmm. And I think it's happening younger and younger. I would agree. One of the issues, I think, is that if you look in the media, that often what you're seeing is a fantasy. Yes. You mentioned airbrushing. Yes. And I've worked with teenagers who um, are anorexic or bulimic, for example, and their standard of what they should look like yeah. is that they should measure up to these models who, in the first instance, are 
too thin to be healthy anyway and are often starving themselves and then yeah. all the imperfections are airbrushed out. Yeah. And helping people to recognise that, you know, they can improve things if they wish to around mm. things like being healthy. Mm. But actually genetically, you know, your height and things like that are predetermined. Yeah. And being comfortable with who you are. Yeah. I think there's a difference between being comfortable and being complacent. Yes. Um, so it is for me around being healthy yeah. rather than being skinny. Yes. Probably just as well because uh, whilst I'm a healthy weight, nobody could describe me as skinny. <laughs> the other thing is it wasn't until I... I got a bit older, I had terrible body image when I was a teenager, I was right. overweight, right. I had really bad eczema uh -huh. on my face and on my hands, mm -hmm. and as a teenager I had to wear white cotton gloves for school, which oh, was right. yeah. murder, Yeah. Um, but I started to recognise that the more you acknowledge your body, at least for its functionality, mm -hmm. even if you don't like it, yes. that's the start. Yes, I, I had... Um, sort of the opposite of what most teenagers, I think, fear, in that when I was growing up, I was a total beanpole, and I used to get called, a, you know, like a matchstick, cause, or, or a golf club, because of uh, the size of my feet and how skinny the rest of me was. And I can particularly remember a whole lot of angst about my riding boots, and how my riding boots never fitted me really nicely, and, and they were always baggy, like Wellington boots, and... I can remember how awful I felt about myself um, and that's being skinny and that's just a genetic predisposition to being skinny. I had no control over it, I mean it didn't matter how much I ate, I just didn't put the weight on. Um, that, that's changed by the way. <laughs> but, yes. um, but that sense of um, being totally trapped within um, a, a body that you don't recognise um, and nowadays, of course, it's not just, in my day, it was magazines that I could look at and fantasise about and wonder why I wasn't like that. But it's social media and all of the filters that get put on, yeah. that everybody's social media life looks so perfect. And I know my daughter is particularly affected by this in, in terms of how she will criticise pictures and uh, scrub her face out in them. That's a particular theme of the youth today, that if they don't feel they look right, they just delete themselves, literally. I, on the screen. I, I, I agree with you. Not only is it there, the images that they put of themselves on Instagram mm. and so on, but also that they're open to comment from other people in quite a brutal way mm. that was never true. You always had a, a, a place to hide. You could go home and, and yeah. at least be safe yeah. um, from criticism of your peers there. If you look at self-image mm -hmm. um, and self-esteem, they're very, very tightly aligned. Yeah. But self-esteem also comes... I mean, many people feel that their importance, their, their value is about what they do or mm -hmm. how much they help other people or how much they um, limit what they want to do in order to please other people. Mm -hmm. And I think... You know, whether the limiting belief is that I'm ugly or mm. I'm nev nobody's ever going to love me because I've got too big a bottom or too big a hips or I'm not mm. the right size, that reflection of our belief is what other people actually see and interact with. Yes. And so working on one's limiting beliefs, I think, is incredibly important. Mm. One of the strategies that I use with clients around body image is go back to this business of functionality. Yes, yes. Now, it wasn't until I couldn't walk that I really began to appreciate my thighs. And yeah. my brother's nickname for me when I was a teenager was Thunder Thighs. Right, thanks. Which, <laughs> very, very helpful, Love, yes. Lovely yes. brother. Yes, <laughs> loved him to bits. Um, but what I recognised when my legs weren't working properly is I'd give anything mm. for those Thunder Thighs to be working properly. Yes. Yes. And so devised a, a technique which needs to be used over time, which was to go into the shower each morning or mm -hmm. bath if you have one. Mm -hmm. And as you wash your hair and you wash yourself, to actually thank each bit of your body. Yes. So, you know, thank you hair for covering my head if yes. you have any. Um, you know, thank you eyes, you've given me the opportunity to see. Mm -hmm. And working your way 
lockdown. Thank you, legs, for, mm. for, for working. And if they don't work very well, thank you for joining my bottom to my feet. <laughs> and doing this in a very playful, light-hearted way. And I think that's mm. really important that there is this element of play rather than, yes. oh, I've got to do yes. this. Yes. Um, and over quite a short space of time, mm -hmm. what clients report back is that the relationship they have with their body begins to change, mm -hmm. subtly to start with. But actually, that change begins to speed up as it becomes yes. part of what you do. Yes. And I think probably it's important to say to um, to listeners that it takes 28 days to create a new neural pathway, a new yeah, pattern yeah. of thinking. Yes. So it's no good doing these sort of techniques once and expecting it to magically um, work things yeah. um, away. You have to do things consistently. Um but I think one of the things you know, to say to listeners and often say to clients, look at those beliefs which empower you. They're huge keepers. Mm -hmm. And the beliefs that limit you, that tell you that you're not good enough, that you're, you don't measure up in some way. Yeah. If there is something you can do about it sensibly and healthily, yes. it makes sense to do it. Yeah. If it is how things are, mm -hmm. then changing the way you approach it and you feel about it yes is the way forward yes look at your limiting beliefs mm. where did they come from mm. because you didn't come into this world with those mm. somewhere mm. along the, the way somebody said you've got a fat bottom or mm. you're not you know, your sister's pr the pretty one and mm. you're the you're the intelligent one mm. or yeah um something like that and you've taken that on board yeah. and you've made it your truth that's really interesting. I have I have a friend who um, has been overweight. I mean, you know, as a medical term, uh, <clears throat> overweight for most of her life. And she approached a particular phase where she decided she was going to get thin, and she did, and she achieved it relatively quickly, but in a relatively healthy way. It wasn't a, a sort of a, a wacko diet, um, and I. I guess it's a bit melodramatic to describe it like this, but she really did disappear into herself as the weight came off. She was, she didn't talk as much in in um, social gatherings. She she was literally half of herself physically, but also in in the way she put herself forward. And um, and it was very strange to watch how she sort of disappeared. And um, it wasn't any, that she had any sort of peer pressure or whatever. She was doing it for herself because she wanted to be healthier. She recognised that she was overweight. And after that phase, um, she decided, well, I, well, it must have been a decision in, this, in, this, in a sense, but she's put all of the weight back on and possibly more again. But she's, she's very common, isn't but it? But she's come back to life. Isn't that interesting? And, and I couldn't help but, but reflect in that sort of process that her... Uh, that perhaps the, the weight for her, just talking about her in particular, I think, the weight is some kind of barrier between herself and the outside world. And that makes me think about how the body is, is the easiest thing for us to control because we are in it. <laughs> and either we um, you know, control it by being super fit or, or we control it by, by overeating or whatever, but, but it's the first thing that perhaps some people step to in order to try and get a sense of control. Really interesting, because mm. I've worked with a number of people who've been abused oh, yeah. um, as children, and I've worked with people who have had really um, difficult situations within their upbringing, which are out of their control, very often to do with parents and divorce and so yeah. on. Yeah. One of the common patterns, I've done a lot of research around this, but one of the common patterns is, particularly around abuse, uh -huh. that many people who were abused as children, and that may be emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, will create a protection which is to become unattractive. Yes. That they they will overeat, and part of that is comfort, because they're unhappy, mm. quite understandably. Uh -huh. But there's, they seem to fall into two different categories. Those who think, if I get fat, I'll be unattractive, they'll yeah. leave me alone. Yeah. And if I get big, mm. I'll be strong and I'll be able to um, fight it. Yes, yeah. And, you know, working with people, and sometimes this is, you know, 
decades later, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s even, often never revealed the abuse. But when you start to unpick why they eat and why they when they got fat, yes. that there are these deep protection um, wishes, mm. probably unconscious, mm. but actually they've become very, very strong. Yeah. And it's only when you start to unravel the impact of the abuse when they start to forgive themselves and the perpetrator. Mm. And I must say, it's really important to recognise that forgiveness is nothing to do with condoning. No. No. Or forgetting. Yes, very different. But if you don't forgive, it's like having a golden chain that keeps you back, held yes. to that, you know, tied yes. to that abuse. Yes. But once they've gone through that process, oh. and I admire them, they've done it's it's not easy, but they have done it, and they've done it for themselves. Oh. Then the weight starts to come off, oh. and you know they don't, they no longer need oh. that protection. If you look at eating disorders, things like anorexia, bulimia, now, yep. not always, but again, my experience has been that they can't control what's going on outside, Yes. Um, but what they can do is control what goes into their mouths. Yes. And it becomes, I think from the out, I mean, it's very complex and I don't want to make A, light of it, or B, simplify it to the point no. of, of, of no. something that it, it's not. But I do think there's a big element where this is I can control mm. what I'm doing. Mm. The other thing that I think that's come across, certainly with the people I've worked, is where there have been divisions between parents, right. the only time those parents have come together, yes. and there's been no acrimony, no arguments, is when my client, as a child or teenager particularly, yeah. has been so poorly because of their anorexia, yeah. Yes. that the parents have stopped their arguing, stopped their war of attrition, yes. and come together. Yes. yes. And that's not just true of anorexia and uh, and other eating disorders, but often about illness. Yes. And so people who become chronically ill, again, I'm not generalising, just mm-hmm. for some, yeah. they've learned as a child, I'm noticed when I'm ill, mm. I'm... I, I get attention, mm. I get what I feel is love, yes. and that's such a strong need. Yes. Um, but also, if parents are at war, then they come together, they're nice to each other, yes. there's a sense of, of being a yes. family yes. when there's a crisis, yes. and so they create a crisis. So at the core of that, that um, desire for attention, and then the tool that they use is going to be how, how they make their body look, or, or you know the method of of doing something as natural as eating um, at the core of that is is some form of emptiness isn't it there's yeah. there's there's a gap Definitely. there's like uh, i am i am not good enough um and i think a lot of people have that as a constant mantra in their heads whether they realize it or not that there's a constant back back level of criticism going on to say you're not good enough you're not good enough um I think you're absolutely right. And interestingly, that when other people tell you you're not good enough, if you believe you're not good enough, there's almost a comfort in that. Because people are are reinforcing your view of yourself. And there is something that feels right about that. And ultimately, the only person who can fill that space is you. Yes. And people look outside. They look outside for permission. They look outside for somebody to approve of them yes when deep down it's I need to approve of myself yes and I believe that when we're genuinely being authentic we're being our genuine selves yes we are perfect as we are yeah now does that mean that you can't improve upon yourself no that's not what I mean by being perfect but there is a perfectness around accepting yourself yes as you are wobbly bits and all and all the bits you don't like however many times I work with people in groups mm-hmm. if I ask them what they don't like about themselves they can write for days uh-huh, yeah <laughs> ask them what they do like about themselves and many of them struggle to put right down three yeah and I that's a, I suggest you know to the listeners give it a go mm. and if you find that it's so much easier to talk about the things you don't like about yourself mm. than those that you appreciate and love about yourself mm. then I think I would say to you you've got some work to do mm. um, 
if you need any help, there's loads of stuff on the website, the genuinely-u.com, um, and you can contact um, me through that if you'd like some help. But I would urge you, what, however you do it, life's too precious to go through it feeling yeah. bad about yourself and beating yourself up all the time. Yeah. Your criticisms of yourself mm. carry far more weight than other people's criticisms of you. I remember somebody, I don't remember who they were, but I remember somebody saying to me in my late teens um, about uh, how, you know, being self-critical and and saying to me, well, would, would you go up to a stranger in the street and say those words to that person? And of course the answer was, good, good grief, no, of course I wouldn't. Uh, and then they said, well, why do you say it to yourself? You know, that you you're being so nasty to yourself mm. in a way that you would never dare to be nasty no. to another human being. Why do you do that to yourself? And that was um, that was a slightly pivotal moment in my in my life of, oh yeah, yeah. There's I have a responsibility to be nice to myself too. Okay. And actually, I do uh, certainly within my own children. I see that the the acceptance of responsibility to fill that gap within themselves, to self care, to manage. I see that actually they, they shy away from the work effort that invo that responsibility involves. Yes. And so I do wonder how many people just get into a habit of shirking that, that effort because it is hard work to manage yourself in that way. Sometimes it's easier just to be self-critical and nasty. Well, well, it's easier to go to what you know. Yeah. It's easier to go to your default model and your default model... It's interesting, and, and those of you that um, uh, uh, look, listen to some of my work will recognise that one of the things that I talk about a lot is that 95% of our thoughts are habitual. Yeah. Yeah. We don't cross our conscious mind. No. So we're not even aware, most of the time, of the patterns of, of how we think and how our thinking then drives our actions and our speech and our, our feelings. If you're not aware of what you're doing... You have no chance to deal with it. Yeah. But I would say really listen to the patterns of language that you use about yourself. Yes. How often do you dumb yourself down by saying, oh, I'm not very good at this, or yeah, I'll do it, but I won't do a great job, mm. or, you know, I'm, I can't do that, or mm. I'm quite good. Um, we dumb it down, and it's partly so other people don't expect too much of us, but a big part of it is so that we aren't disappointing ourselves yes and and I know a lot of people who won't describe themselves as proud of themselves yeah because they've got this negative association with the word pride or being proud that it's um too big for your boots yes. and um you know know your place and all of these sorts of things and that's often come from parents or teachers and I think mm. both parents and teachers are doing the best they can but they often install incredibly limiting beliefs yeah, in people. almost unknowingly. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like to think it was unknowingly. And I think for the most part it is because they're thinking habitually. Yes. And of course we all bring our own baggage. Yes. It's an interesting relationship between children and parents in that so often when parents have been critical, mm. when you talk to the parents, it's because they want the best for their child. They want mm. them to do better than they did. Mm. From the child's point of view, and I'm talking about child as adult now, yeah. that they think that the parents didn't love them. Yes. That they were never going to be good enough to actually um, match up to that expectation of those parents. Right. And I would say if you're a parent out there, you know, one of the things that can make a real difference is if you want your child to be even better, mm -hmm. listen to the word even better, mm. predis a presupposition mm. that actually it's not bad, it's it's going to get better, mm. um, is that if you've got a criticism, criticise the behaviour yeah. and not the child, you yeah. know. I don't like what you're doing. Yeah. You know, you're you can do so much better than that. Yes. Um, I love you mm. and I think you're great. However, that behaviour mm. just not acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a huge difference between saying you're stupid, you're you know, you're clumsy, you're yeah. useless yeah. to that's you know why in on this occasion have you been clumsy well maybe if you tied your shoelaces up or yes. perhaps if you walked rather than run yes then you wouldn't <laughs> fall over yes. so I think 
I, mean, I think it's really difficult being a parent. And there's a podcast that I, you know, a radio show that mm. I've done on being a parent, some tips. But mm. kids don't come with a manual. so No, they don't. <laughs> I don't want parents to be beating themselves up, um, or teachers for that matter, but just to be mindful, to actually think about the language that you use. Yes. And if you find that your child is saying things about themselves around... Um, you know that they're no good or that they don't look good in this yes then don't just brush it under the carpet no no S- start to yeah. to deal with it and I've known children as young as five and six who are posturing in uh you know pretending they're models yes. sucking their mouths Doing in that and, awful trout pout um and <laughs> you know saying that I'm too fat yes and I think that's a tragedy for yes. taking their childhood away from them yes yeah um, Absolutely agree that there's far too much um, pressure, external pressure, um, and um, and a lot of that I think comes from the systems that they're put in uh, as children, too too young, and so on. Um, you know, but we won't. That's a whole society. different discussion, isn't no, it? We won't. Um, but uh, you know, what yeah. I would say to you as listeners, you do an audit of your your beliefs. Which are the ones which are really supporting you and empowering you? which are the ones which are not. Um, and those are the ones I think that need dealing with mm. because they will govern your life. Once you have a belief, you look for evidence that that belief is right. Yes. You interpret everything to make that belief right. Mm. And of course, if you look for it hard enough, well, you're going to find it, it, aren't you? Yes. Whereas if you are able to challenge that belief, mm. Is this really the truth? But what about the fear of failure? My Again, I had a friend whose aunt, she never did any of her real dreams. She was a fantastic violin player, but she never pushed herself on it. And when I asked my friend, why does your aunt not really, cause she's so good, why does she not do something mm-hmm. with it? And she said, oh, that's because my aunt believes that it's better to have dreams and, and live with the dream of it possibly happening than to try it and fail. And it was one of the most depressing moments of my oh, life. I've got to say, that. what a tragedy. Yes, but I, I totally get that sort of standing on the precipice of, of trying to do something that is, you know, a dream of yours. And what if you fail? How, how do we get people beyond that particular barrier? I believe there are three ways of thinking, and I think those govern our lives. We know we're going to fail, and people who think, I'm going to fail, mm-hmm. just don't start. And so that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you, if you work your life on, I'm going to fail so I'm not going to try, yeah. then there is no chance of success. There's then a group of people who live their life through, I fear I'm going to fail. Mm. And so they make a set of decisions which is about keeping being kept safe. And that's our uh, unconscious mind's sole purpose in life is to keep us safe. Yes. But in that very safety, very often, there is a trap. Mm. The people who are highly successful, and I've done a huge amount of research on this, Mm -hmm. they have one thing in common. Mm. They don't feel less fear. No. What they do is they have a a, a belief that they will succeed. They don't need to know how to start with, Mm. but they will keep working at doing different things until they succeed. Okay. And they see every failure as a form of development. Mm. The only failure is the failure to try yeah. or the failure to learn yeah. from your mistakes. And if you look at look at your life, and if I look at mine, mm-hmm. have you learned more from getting it right first time or from not getting it right, adjusting, trying something different, adjusting, trying something different? Well, I can confidently say that I have never got it right first time. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's a belief. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe once or twice, but generally speaking, uh, I needed to launch into it and start doing, and um, uh, and not worry about too much about perfect. And actually, in my writing, it's a very key discipline for me: is not worry about writing a perfect science, uh, sentence, because there's if I do that, I will never write the sentence, but write a truthful sentence, and then try to polish it to a point of greater loveliness. And um, yeah, and it's interesting that you use the word try because yeah. because I know you don't like the word try in the sense that people use it to sort of keep the challenge uh, away from yeah, them. To I, get I, stuck I'll try in it. to yeah. do it, but but 
the people that are successful are the ones who do try as in the active yes. verb. Yeah, yeah, they put actual action behind it. I think being perfect or the need to be perfect is the absolute core or at the absolute core of procrastination. Right, yeah. Whereas good enough, you know, let's start with good enough and then let's refine that and make it better. Yeah. But at least you get started. Yeah. Um, this is a case in point. It's not perfect, um, but we'll refine how we do things. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately, I've been out of my comfort zone so much over the last year as we've started to develop the Thrive Tribe and mm. writing the last book and so on. You know, if it, I had to wait till everything was perfect, nothing would have happened. No. And I would say to people, you know, part of living, part of developing is being prepared to get it wrong. Yeah learn from it yeah that's the success is when you learn from it yeah and if you're a, a, a manager or a leader develop a culture of development not blame that we learn from how we develop things and we've got to be prepared to give things a try even if those things are, are not perfect first time learn from it and move on and most people are very forgiving of other people's genuine mistakes. I think life. that's absolutely true. Yeah. I think that's a really good place for us to finish today. So thank you very, very much for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. Um, love to know what you think and also love to know if there are conversations that you'd like us to share with you. The website, genuinely-you.com, there's loads of free resources on there. And I look forward to being with you next time. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye-bye. You've just been listening to another great Genuinely You podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Genuinely You is a culmination of Gina's work, spanning over 30 years of helping people learn what makes them feel happy and truly fulfilled and how to achieve it. Please visit genuinely-you.com today to find out more.